I'm sorry. Uh, so nobody had any questions till start. Did you have any questions from last time? Okay, not that we really got into a whole lot, but we were um, Tuesday. We sort of wrapped up the with the idea of economics as a study of human behavior. What we spent our money on is an indication of what's important to us. What we spend our time on is an indication of what's important to us. That will be the definition I'm looking for on the test. Is a study of human behavior, not that crap that was on the other slides that I told you not to write down. Um, and after class, I thought of something else, and I can't about this, and I can't remember what it was. I don't know. I've only taught this class 20 and like 30 times. Uh, this first chapter is just sort of economic basics. We're going to be hopping from this little in, intro principle to that one, to that one, to that one, to that one, and we just start the flow, the transition is going to be a little bit rough for the first, for the next week or so. It's kind of like we're talking football, you ain't watching the game, we're starting with this is a football. This is a cleat, this is a tee, right? So that's where we are here. But any economy, good economy, hopefully solid economy, it starts with ownership, our right to have things, call it our own and do with it what we want to do with it. Because if we don't have ownership, kind of what's the point of doing things? If I don't have the right to own property, well then, am I ever going to build a house? No, because why am I going to build a house on some land that somebody else is going to take away from me, right? Am I ever going to buy a car if somebody can, you know, park in the parking lot, somebody else can, gets in and drives away? Heck no. So a good functioning working economy has some kind of recognition of private property rights and ownership, because without those, not only are we not going to build a house, but we certainly aren't going to build a business. You know, maybe we'll build some kind of house, maybe if it's a tree house up in a tree and hopefully nobody who discovers it so we're out of the rain, but we certainly aren't going to be investing our time and our money and our skills and our efforts into some business that somebody else is going to come and take away. Do you all remember nationalism in your history class years ago? You know, there's people who are mad they set up companies, spent millions and millions of dollars on it just to have the government come and say, eh, thank you, we'll take it from here. You know, that kind of, doing that kind of thing kills anybody's motivation for making new businesses, making economic progress. But, oh, I'm sorry, this transition didn't work right here. So anyway, it's supposed to do one at a time, all eight of them, but the last four showed up. In any economy, there are eight goals. You need to know a little more than half of them on the test. But you need to know all of them for the rest of your life. Just because you do. And I normally show these one at a time, but I've made that I screw up transition when I, I switched to Google Slides and that got broken. Um, eight goals for the economy. These are all good goals, but there are some hiccups that come along the way because you can't have them all. Economic growth, that is growing our economy. That's a goal. Okay, let's put on your hat. Congratulations, you've been elected to Congress. That's the hat for you to think of now. You are all Congress critters, okay? So you're in Congress and you're thinking about how are we gonna direct the economy? These are the goals to start swimming for. First one, economic growth. Get the economy to grow to create jobs. This is a must. I have a slide somewhere about this. We have to have economic growth. We have to create more jobs. Anybody want to take a guess why? Okay, so people won't be out of jobs. Okay, what people? Who? Why? Back to the rights and ownership. I mean, job means money. money means yeah, but but why? But why, why do we need it to grow? Because the world is growing. Bingo! Our population is growing. We need the economy to grow because we got more humans. So we got more humans next year than we have this year, which means we're gonna need more food next year than this year. We'll need more clothes this year than next year, more cars this year. I just said all that backwards. We'll need <laughs> more cars next year, more food next year, more chainsaws next year, more jobs for those people that are graduating so they can actually have paychecks to buy stuff. We have to have economic growth because our population is growing. If our economy is growing, it has to grow at, at least at the rate that the population is growing. 
if our population is growing by 5% a year, well, we need 5% more jobs to create, to employ these 5% more workers or else our unemployment rate goes up. We need to make 5% more cars, grow 5% more corn, raise 5% more chickens, make 5% more t-shirts. We've got to do that. So we have to have economic growth unless our population is declining. Is our population shrinking? No, we're growing at about 3% a year. So we have to have economic growth. If you're Republican, if you're Democrat, on either side of the aisle, you're saying, yeah, economic growth, that's, that's gonna be one of the big ones in our top. That's, that's gonna be in the top three Republicans and Democrats. Efficiency, how many of you like efficiency? Yeah, waste not, want not. We don't wanna waste things. So we don't want people making stuff they don't need, making stuff that people don't want, not making stuff that people do want, that's kind of being efficient. Taking an entire tree, sticking it on a lathe, and turning it down in order to get one toothpick, that's kind of a waste. We don't like that kind of thing. Efficiency makes a better use of our resources. Don't try to grow things where they don't want to grow. Don't try to make people do things that they can't do. Find people that can do it. Efficiency is a good goal. Security. Economic security, talking about like job security and that kind of stuff. How happy would you how happy would you be with your job if you have no idea when you go in tonight whether they're gonna fire you or not? And you just sitting there like any given day they can let me go. They're letting people go and today is one person, the next day is the next person, I could be next to you be freaking out, right? You never know. You don't know if when you go to work tonight if the doors are gonna be open because the company might shut down. Is that gonna cause a problem for you? You never know whether to, you, you've got extra money, congratulations, you know who you are, you have extra money. Oh, uh, it's, um, don't tell me, um, Jenny. Jenny has extra money, she's throwing it around, well instead of throwing it around, she's gonna lend it to somebody else. Is she gonna lend that money to somebody else if she doesn't know whether they're gonna ever pay her back or not? No. Security, stability is a pretty good idea, right? Economic freedom. Let people do what they want to do. If you want to raise chickens, you can raise chickens. If instead of chickens you want to raise ducks, you can raise ducks. If you want to make a, sm a smartphone that doesn't have a headphone jack, you can make a smartphone that doesn't have a headphone jack. What are you thinking? But it, it, you, you can do whatever you want to do, and you don't. You're not forced to do. You know, congratulations. Uh, your you know your your daddy was a carpenter. Your granddaddy was a carpenter. Guess what you're going to do, my little one year old baby. You're going to be a carpenter when you grow up. You've got no choice in the matter. The government has said so. So you're, here's your, your, your rattle in the shape of a hammer. Get used to it now. Right? <laughs> we don't do that kind of thing. Freedom, freedom is good. Anybody have any problems so far? Yeah, I'm going to metaphorically set my little invisible baby down. I don't want to just, <laughs> just. We have conflicts here. Freedom and security, freedom and efficiency don't always go together. I've got the freedom to start a business if I want to start a business. I've got the freedom to shut down a business if I want to shut down a business. Well, that might end up impacting somebody's job security, right? Uh, it would kind of suck if the government came along with law saying, yeah, everybody, when you hire them 40 hours a week, 52 weeks a year is what you've got to work them, and you can't fire them until they're 65. Workers are going to be like, whoo, 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 but the business people are going to be like, crap, I've just lost my economic freedom. If I'm financially in the hole, things are getting tight, and I've got to do something, and then you won't let me get rid of my workers, you won't let me sell off a truck, you won't let me take on new customers, these things can conflict with one another. Economic security. If you set rules about the I've got to work people 40 hours a week, whether I've got 40 hours a week worth of work for them to do or not, well, that ain't a vision. So these things do end up conflicting with one another and it just keeps going on, getting worse as I start adding these next things on. Full employment is the idea of everybody that has a job, everybody who wants a job has a job. But then that's gonna fly in the face of freedom, right? Um, price stability. Okay, it sucks when today you pay 238 a gallon for gas and then tomorrow you're gonna pay 242. Uh, sometimes you get your milk for a dollar and a half a gallon, sometimes you're paying close to four dollars a gallon, you know, that kind of stuff, kind of sucks, kind of thing. We would like it if everything was flat and smooth and predictable. 
but it doesn't work that way because okay, our introduced a couple years ago really spiked up. It like doubled in price. Well, because we had a couple hurricanes come through. So instead of us being able to drink orange juice that was grown on trees in Florida that were only trucked a few hours up the highway, our orange juice was coming from California, which was trucked three days. So we had to pay those truck drivers that much more money and spend that much more gas to be delivering this orange juice 2,500 miles instead of 500 miles. Well, I got to pay the truck driver more and buy the extra gas. What do I got? I've got to raise my prices on my product. Or, so, yeah. fair distribution of income. Well, I idea whether everybody that works 40 hours a week, or if you work 40 hours a week, you ought to get the same as somebody else working 40 hours a week. I ain't quite that simple because some people have jobs that are more important than others, have additional skills more than other people. Um, I mean, it's nice to try to ha have fairness, but you can't have really true e equality because, and we'll get to this at some point in the semester, if everybody got paid the same, and you had a choice of being a doctor or a used car salesman, which job are you taking? Car salesman. Because you ain't got to go through seven years worth of medical school. You ain't got to worry about having your beeper going off. Well, okay, not your phone thing going off at two o'clock in the morning. Beep, beep, beep. Somebody's having a life or death car emergency. They need a used car now at 2 a.m. in the morning, right? You don't have that kind of stuff. So there are some jobs that are more important than others and they need to be rewarded and need to have the incentive because otherwise what's going to happen, which I'm giving you all, I think it's chapter eight right now. Like right now we have a shortage of teachers. So yes, we, a lot of states. Yes, a lot of states. And, it, and it's actually worse in North Carolina than it is in Virginia just because their pay is only about 80% in North yeah. Carolina what they pay here in Virginia and it's just, it's, yeah, it's $30,000 Yes. Um, excellent point, but of course I just lost it. All <laughs> side. Oh, no, no, that's fine. No, please, like I said, jump in, but um, I really ought to be jotting down notes. The, um, oh, yeah, okay, so picture this. If the choices were medical school, used car salesman, let's simplify the whole world down to those two jobs. Well, which are you going to go to? Car salesman. So if I'm running a car dealership and every all of y'all want to be car salesmen, well, who am I going to hire? The smartest and the best. So who's going to end up going to medical school? Those people who are too stupid to become a used car salesman. <laughs> and are we okay with that as a society? No. You know, there's some issues there. Right. Also, like, you don't want to be a doctor and get paid the same amount as your car yeah. salesman. Like, yeah, I don't want to get, take on the student loans, risk of all these lawsuits and all this kind of crap in order to get paid the same as a used car salesman. Have the little life and death emergency knowing that if I'm like, yeah, I hiccup at the wrong time while I got my hand in somebody's guts, they're dead. <laughs> you know, I get that, all that extra stress and all that kind of stuff to get the same money as car salesman, I don't think so. So, issues there. Balance of trade, this is whole, Fairness is what we're looking for here. Go back to it. I know y'all are like economics. This is an econ class. You're thinking deep. Think shallow. Think trade when you're five years old. I've got this Spider-Man comic book. You've got the Batman comic book. I will give you the Spider-Man comic book. You give me the Batman comic book. All right. Is that fair if the Spider-Man comic book is issue number one, it's worth $2,000, that's what I'm giving to my brother, and the Batman comic book he's giving me has been scrawled on by a bunch of crayons, is only worth 10 cents? That ain't fair. I'm getting victimized, I'm getting hurt. And how many times can I get victimized that way before it seriously impacts my ability to do anything? And then flip side, my brother Joey, in which he usually would beat me up instead, um, <laughs> he would beat me up and take Spider-Man comic book but if he burned me the first time and I find out he messed me over, am I going to trade with him again? No. So is there value in having fair trade? Yeah. So the idea of trading between me and my brother is if I give him something of equal value to what he gives me, 
I'm in the same or better shape than I was before. He's in the same or better shape than he was before. He's now got the Spider-Man comic book that he would rather have, and I now have the Batman comic book that I would rather have. So we're in the same financial shape, but we're psychologically, emotionally in better shape. Hmm? Yes. So then we're, I'm happy, he's happy, he's not going to beat me up and take my Spider-Man comic book and all that kind of stuff we're going to end up talking about at the end of chapter two. Um, but economically, we're in the same boat. But if he's cheating me time after time after time and I don't realize it, I'm losing money, losing money, losing money, and then suddenly I can't afford to buy any products and I have issues. In a world setting, if... What we're selling them is of equal value to what they're selling us. We sell them a million dollars worth of products. They sell us a million dollars of products. Well, we gave up a million dollars worth of jobs. I'm just, just really glossy. We're giving up a million dollars worth of jobs by buying stuff from them instead of making it ourselves. But we're gaining a million dollars worth of jobs in the jobs making the stuff that we're selling to them. So what happens? We lose a few jobs. We gain a few jobs. It's basically even. And we haven't screwed ourselves over, right? But if the trade balance isn't fair, and this is kind of what President Trump's really been hammering on starting in March, he said it's really not fair. So what's happening is they're buying a whole lot less of our stuff than we're buying from them. So we're buying, it, we're getting a trillion dollars worth of stuff and they're only buying 500 billion worth from us. So we're creating more jobs for them and losing jobs for us and we're slowly losing jobs and he's over there saying well that's too much and so he's doing the middle fingers in the air throwing up the tariffs and all that kind of stuff which seemed like they lumped on another set of them yesterday <laughs> we'll talk about that at the end of chapter two but balance trade freedom what it ain't the united states and china it is american companies and chinese companies that are trading the government, sort of the referee, the police officer, that's all. They're not involved with the trade. So what's happening? Why is it that American companies are buying more Chinese-made products than Chinese companies are buying American-made products? Cheaper, because they're paying their workers about $3 an hour, where we're paying a minimum of seven and a quarter for our workers. So if you're Walmart, you're like, well, we can put a thing of socks on a shelf for three dollars a pack or we can put a thing of socks on the shelf for six dollars a pack which is going to sell better three dollars a pack and all well, those come from china well okay well if we're like well all about whatever freedom we, so we had the freedom walmart to buy socks and bring them in from china but that might be impacting our balance of trade but then if the government's like all oh, balance of trade then walmart's gonna be saying well crap we can't get these three dollar socks anymore sorry y'all here's the six dollar american made socks enjoy good luck and you and i don't like that because it kind of messes up with what we can do with our limited paycheck right. so these things all end up being out they all are nice when you look at them on their own but you can't have them all you got to compromise if you're republican no let's start with democrat if you're democrat what's your top three i already gave you one of them growth security security i'd buy that um, it's going to be, I'm so a little bit going to lump the fair distribution of income, stability, back, going back to the security thing. Um, Democrats, you can kind of think of them as, I, I think of them as two ways. Number one, the protective older brother. Not my older brother, but the one that will protect. <laughs> Not beat. The, Oh, you know, you're in high school and you get the letter jacket and woohoo, I, I, I got my letter jacket, what a score. And I'm like on the bus riding home that very day and then my brother comes over to seat and pow right in my nose. <laughs> anyway, y'all didn't have that. Congratulations. <laughs> but the protective older brother that's going to look out for the little people or Robin Hood, take the rich, give to the poor. That's kind of Democrats in a nutshell. And so they're looking out for those people that can't look out for themselves, taking care of those people that can't take care of themselves, struggling, that kind of thing. So they're going to be looking for security, stability, that kind of thing, to where, you know, those people that, you know, okay, well, you lose your job because of the trade thing. Well, we're going to pay money so you can get a college education so you can get another job. That's kind of the, where the Democrats are going. Is there anything wrong with that? 
No. Okay. Flip the coin. Republicans. Okay, growth being your third one. Republicans. Growth being number one. What are the other two for you for the Republicans? Freedom and efficiency. Freedom and probably efficiency. Yes. If I, if I was to describe a Republican in one sentence, it's you can do what you want to do. Just don't stop me from doing what I want to do. Or pure liberty, is, which I was talking about this in my law class, you can do what you want to do as long as you don't keep other people from doing what they want to do. That is liberty. That is the foundation of all of our laws in the United States. Think about that. You can do what you want to do as long as you don't keep others from doing what they want to do. Murder is illegal. If you kill me, you keep me from doing what I want to do. Live. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you thinking about those whatever dudes a few months ago, the branch or whatever? No, uh, I figured you. Yeah, well, it was apparently they kind of stand your ground in law, but it's like it's like way more intense than Florida or something. And people can basically get away with murder. Okay, but it's got to be murder and self-defense is sort of the, oh, 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 we talk about this, like, you know, you shoot them and then you drag them up, up, up out of your front yard into your house because then I was trapped and then you get away with it. Yes, okay, yes, but no, I was not aware of that. <laughs> but but that, that's, the thing. Gee. I'll put a pin in that one. If we have a minute at the end of class, I will tell you how to kill some, no, no. <laughs> No, no, you know, just uh, th there's a couple legal principles there, and I'll just maybe cheat. Okay, you can't kill somebody because it keeps them from doing what they want to do. Live. You can't steal from somebody because it keeps them from doing what they want to do. Owning stuff, right? All the laws are coming down to that. So then it's like, okay, speeding. We well, can't do more than 55 miles an hour on certain roads. Why? Because they've determined. If you're going faster than that, the odds of you getting in a wreck are a lot higher, and the damage that's going to happen when you get in that wreck is enough higher that we've decided that's too great of a chance of you keeping somebody else from doing what they want to do live because you're going to get in an accident. You might pop. So that's why we've got speed limits. All of our laws come down to the you can do what you want to do as long as it doesn't keep other people from doing what they want to do. So then the default position is if in doubt, don't. If I'm not sure if I can take the, if I'm not sure if I can take this, see, I see this field here. If I'm not sure I can take my four wheeler and go doing some donuts out there in the field or not, I shouldn't do it. I shouldn't just say, well, I don't see a sign saying no trespassing. Woohoo, party, y'all! <laughs> no. If you don't know, don't. That is what our legal system is based on. Those two principles right there. If in doubt, don't. I mean, yeah, if in doubt, don't. Otherwise, you can do what you want to do as long as you don't keep other people from doing what they want to do. That is, that ain't freedom, that's liberty. Okay? And that's what we're, we're society, liberty. Not necessarily freedom, we use the word freedom, but it's really technically liberty. Okay? So, having said that, pure Republican philosophy is just that. I'm taking the, you can do what you want to do as long as it doesn't keep me from doing what I want to do. Well. Let me do what I want to do. Get out of my way. If you're the government, get out of my way. I don't need government rules, regulations, this kind of stuff. This is keeping me from doing what I want to do. As long as I'm not stopping somebody else, as long as I'm not victimizing somebody else, stealing their property or whatever. If you want to, you want to run a business milking chickens, you go ahead and think about that. You want to run a business milking chickens, go ahead. If I want to run a business milking chickens, go ahead. As long as I'm milking my chickens on my land, what's it to you? Right? That's pure Republican philosophy there. It's gotten lost in translation over the last couple of decades, but pure Republican philosophy is that. Get out of the way. Let business take care of it. The business of business is business. That was what, Herbert Hoover or something? History major? Anybody? I was. <laughs> you was? Okay. Well, you were. Uh, <laughs> now I'm the history teacher. Great job. Yes, okay. Well, well, well you're going to be a teacher, so you were a teacher to teacher. Okay. But... So Republicans, that's that. I mean, is there anything evil with that? Is there anything wrong with the you do what you want to do, let me do what I want to do? If you don't want to do anything, you don't have to do anything. If I want to do something, let me. As long as I'm not hurting anybody. There's nothing inherently evil with Republican philosophy either. And they're like freedom, efficiency, growth. If 
I got an idea, I've got some knowledge, and I want to capitalize on my knowledge, my idea, and make money and create jobs and make me money, money, money. Woo -hoo. Well, let me know. You said over the last couple of decades that philosophy's kind of been muddied up. Like, what do you say that it is now? Both the Republicans and the, okay, this is not to, the, the, pure opinion at this point, disclaimer here. Both the Republicans and Democrats, it's, they both have gone from looking 20, 30, 50 years into the future to now they're looking at when now. They're looking at each individual law, each individual argument, each individual case, each individual, how can I win now? They ain't looking for a happy marriage. They're looking to, I want to win the fight before we go to bed tonight. That's where they are. And so they're losing sight of the big picture. Both of them are. I mean, that's all the crap that's been going on in Washington for the last five, six years, especially. It's, they're just, you know, I don't like you, so I'm going to do everything I can to poke you in the eye. Oh, th this law, I might perfectly agree with it, but it was suggested by somebody in the other party, so sorry, middle fingers in the air, can't do it. And so you got all of these things where the straight line, Republicans are voting nothing but Republican, Democrats are voting nothing but Democrats. There's hardly anybody that's crossing over. And so a lot of these votes are just straight, all Republicans versus all Democrats. So then it's, it just comes down to the math of which party has more votes, period, because there's nobody using their brains and thinking about the overall well-being of society. They're just towing the party line. And that's where it, it's all about getting the win to get if we get enough wins, then we can say, hey, we're winners, and people will elect us the next time around. And that's, that's just my opinion, but that's where politics has gotten. Yes? Is it possible to fix that? Like, is there any fast way to get everyone to play nice? Well, when Congress stands off, we get your place. <laughs> uh, fast? No. <laughs> the problem is that they get, like, pretty much as long as they keep getting reelected. Because Congress doesn't have a set amount of time they're allowed to be in Congress. Yeah. Term limits, maybe, but uh, no. Because <laughs> part of our thing is you can't do the factory reset, like you, you on your phone. You can't do the factory reset every two years. Yep, all the House of Representatives, every one of them is up for re-election every two years. Yep. So, we could, the lower house, completely all Americans could middle fingers in the air. We could literally drain the swamp, whatever it was in Trump. And all new, all 430, 435 of them, all brand new. But then you'd have 430, we'd have a brand new House of Representatives, and we could completely change a third of the Senate, all in just a few months. This is 2016, 18, 20, yeah, in just a few months, we could completely brand new, 100% brand new House Representatives, and then replace a third of the Senate. But then you have people in there that don't know how to do things. That they could have learned from the people that have been doing it for a while. Just like how, you know, what's the right way to frame a law? Who do we have to talk, how do you make things? But then you end up getting stuck with the, well, so, well, we don't want to get rid of everybody. So you gotta have people who know how to do it and then you bring the other people in, but then the new people that are gonna come in, they're gonna end up a lot of absorbing the culture of those that are already there. And it's just, it's sort of, it's so, it's a slow, slow moving. It ain't like turning a car, it ain't like turning a bicycle, it's like turning a aircraft carrier. They, you need a few square miles to turn an aircraft carrier. And that's probably, it takes a while to do it and it takes planning to do it because you can't, the captain of the aircraft carrier can't just yank the ship because there's a button, yank the wheel because there's a bunch of other ships floating around them too. That's actually a very good metaphor there. <laughs> um, yeah, 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 you can't just, so it's just gonna be a slow burn, but what we as American citizens, what we've got to do is we gotta pay attention, we gotta care, and we as individuals gotta think about more of themselves. We have to be thinking about society as a whole people as a whole, Americans as a whole, the world as a whole. Are Americans better than the rest of the world? Is a human being? No. But we think, well, America's number one. Well, maybe our government is, our governmental philosophy is better than the governmental philosophy of other countries around the world, but an American human being isn't any better than a Chinese human being, a French human being that just won the World Cup, right? 
of yourself and human being, we're not better, but we have this arrogance. We are better. This arrogance, we do deserve this arrogance. Give me, give me, give me, and don't make me work in order to get it. We have a lot of that here in the United States where in other parts of the world, they're like, I'm working like a dog and I ain't getting nothing. And then just, but we have to be thinking beyond ourselves because we're all, I was talking about our paycheck a little bit ago. We're mad that Walmart ain't got the $3 socks, $6 socks now, so our paycheck doesn't go very far. And then we're mad because our unemployment rate is so high, it's hard for people to find jobs, good paying jobs here. Well, part of the problem is, it's because you and I were buying the $3 pairs of socks. So the American companies weren't selling the $6 pairs of socks, so what happened? Those companies shut down. So if we want to create jobs in America, we as Americans need to do what? Invest. Invest in America, buy American products, which will call, create jobs for American, com for American workers and American companies. But okay, so I can't get as many pairs of socks because I'm paying $6 for my pairs of socks instead of $3 for my pairs of socks. But that's, are you willing to make that sacrifice for the greater society? And unfortunately, 98% of us, no. Oh, what class was this? Oh, okay. Yeah. Who was your teacher? Gary Cypress. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yes, I know Gary. But um, he was saying basically how we probably won't have too many jobs for people to go to anymore because of like Amazon. Yes. It's probably going to be online after lunch. Yeah. That, that's part of our self checkout. Yeah. Yeah. The robots. Yes, we're going from competing with humans to competing against robots in the future or just machines in general. And it's been happening under our noses. Have any of y'all looked in the kitchen of Pizza Hut? What do you say? Um, people cooking. Yeah, but how are they cooking? They've got this little conveyor belt thingy that somebody puts the sauce and the cheese and the pepperoni on the pizza and then they stick it in the conveyor belt. It's set at a preset temperature and it rolls out at the preset speed or whatever so that pizza comes out the other end perfectly cooked. Every time. So there's no somebody going over there to open the oven and okay, you lift it up a little bit. Okay, we need to give it another 30 seconds, that kind of stuff. It ain't happening because Pizza Hut was having a hard time having people that were paying attention and carrying, keeping up with things. And too many pizzas were getting burned, too many pizzas were getting lost, too many pizzas were getting under quality control replaced by a machine. Burger King. How are they grilling their hamburgers now? Same thing. Yeah, they're flame broiled, they got the flames, but they're rolling over conveyor belts, so they perfectly come out on the other side. We're already competing with machines. Farmers. I mean, I, I can speak to farm because I am one. Yeah, we used to get square hay bales. That they weigh about 40, 50 pounds, and they're square, so you can stack them, and you just pick, you just pick them up and throw it up on the truck. But unfortunately, that's ugly work because you're stacking them like six high in the truck. So, no. square bale, you got to take the bale and you got to chuck it way up there, and it's the hot heat of the day, and so you're working in the heat, you're sweating. So, have any of you ever rolled in wet grass? Any of you? Yeah. <laughs> okay. The, what's the word? Begins with an I. Itching. So what do you do to keep it? You got all this stuff falling off these hay bales and all that kind of stuff. So what do you do? You put on long sleeve shirts. So you're out there in a 90 degree temperature, 100 degree humidity, wearing long sleeves and pitching these 40, 50 pound bales of hay out of the back of a pickup truck. So is that a good work? Good job? No. Four days of the year, I need people to do that. Can I find people to help me? But I got to get the hay out of the field when I got to get the hay out of the field because otherwise it's going to start getting mold and that kind of crap and it's killing the grass underneath them. So what it, farmers couldn't, so how much would I have to pay any of you to come out to my farm and do that for me for a day? Just today. Today and four more times during the course of the year. <laughs> or just, 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 just today. Any of you for $10 an hour? Oh, I got two of you for Oh, dude! I'm pulling, I'm pulling tobacco for $8 an hour. Oh, well, you, well okay, pulling tobacco, that's, that's hard. Hard. I would much rather do the hay than to pull a tobacco. That's what I'm saying, $10 an hour, I'd do it. Yes, yes. yes. Score! I'm, I'm, I need to go get the square hay baler fixed. I'm like, dude. But what I have is farmers couldn't find people to do the work. So what do we have to do? You could, we could reliably do it. 
because we're like, I never know, you know, this year I had five people raise their hand or last year I had like one person raise their hand and you'd have to, have, I got to get the hay up and I don't know if I'm going to have people or not or whatever. So what are they? The big round hay bale. So the big baler makes that big, huge uh, hay bale, and then you've got a prong sticking out of the back of your tractor, and you just back up, stick it in it, lift it up, and a farmer can get their hay out of the field all by themselves. Techno Technology has been replacing us. Yeah, computers, that kind of stuff. It's just going to keep going. So we're asking ourselves right now, are we, as human beings, more valuable than somebody in Vietnam or something like that that we're competing with for a job? Well, then sometime we're going to be asking, are we more valuable than the robots and computers that we're competing with? And well, that we're kind doing of it to ourselves. Yeah, we're doing it to ourselves. Just setting out the machinery part of it. I've got to, we as Americans say, I've got to have, I want, I deserve minimum wage, seven and a quarter an hour. The average manufacturing salary in the United States, the average is like $16 an hour, which means half of you manufacturing workers are making more than $16 an hour. The average in China just a few years ago was like $3 an hour. Average, the average in China, the average, and it's even lower in countries like Vietnam, South Korea, and a bunch of other countries. The average is half of our minimum. In some of those I mean, places, they don't even get paid their amount to Yes, they're, they're allowed to live somewhere in a house that daddy didn't build them, wearing clothes that mama didn't make them. And that's valuable to a lot of people, so that's why they're getting it. But just if you think about it, every American, every American worker is getting paid twice as much as the average worker in China. That's the issue that we have to compete. But we're like, are any of us willing to take a pay cut? Because we didn't get pay cuts and then you can't live nowhere because the cost Living is expensive. Yes, and part of the reason why the cost of living is so expensive is because the other people are demanding so much, so much, so much. And it's it's an ugly little furball there. See, but, but the solution, oh, geez, I, we'll, we'll get back to this, Chef. <laughs> what we've done, what, two whole slides today? Score. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be done with chapter one by Thanksgiving. But, but I mean, this is good because we get to all of this at some point. I'll catch you in a minute if I don't actually. Yeah. Um, Things are going to settle out in the future, but there's going to be growing pains. Because here's what's going to happen: is they're getting the jobs, we're losing the jobs. Is we're losing the jobs, we've got more and more workers out here flirting around saying, "I want a job, I want a job," and we start getting it. I'll take any job, whatever. Wages will go down in America, but at the same time, you know, Chinese worker, Chinese companies, they got hey, we got plenty of people to hire, plenty of people to choose from, so I don't have to pay a whole lot of money. But then as more and more Chinese workers get hired, more and more Vietnamese workers get hired, guess what? Wages are going to be going, and they are going up in China. So what is going to end up happening? It might take another 40 years, but that wage difference is going to go from 3 to 16. It's going to be more like 8 to 12. And so that $4 an hour savings might not be enough to pay for the fuel to put the thing in the ship and sail it across the Pacific Ocean, right? So things are going to settle out at some point, but it may be 50 years before it happens, and we're going to have some growing pains in the meantime, and we're kind of doing it now because we already got people that are griping that their paychecks can't go very far, and y'all are really, y'all weren't paying attention when y'all were like five to see what's happened in the economy right here when all of our textile companies shutting down, furniture companies shutting down, and that kind of stuff, and all the, all the job loss that's happened here, the shrinking population here in Southside, Virginia, because... We're one of the first ones that's taking the pain of this transition. And that's why a good good reason for why Southside Virginia Community College is here is we can't compete manufacturing-wise against three dollars an hour. Against the with the good transportation global transportation system we have. So we need to do something different. If you want job security when you grow up, Figure out a job that cannot easily be outsourced to China, to India, to a robot. That's where job security is. If you're doing something that can easily be replaced by a machine, guess what? That's probably going to happen to you. If you're doing something that can be easily done somewhere else, that's going to happen to you. Teaching? You teachers? Elementary school, well, okay, you can't have somebody remotely over the telephone or TV or something changing diapers. Well, you shouldn't have diapers. 
kindergarten. <laughs> but you know what I mean. But my job, I teach people halfway across the state. What's the difference between me teaching somebody halfway across the state and somebody halfway across the nation, or halfway across the planet? Uh, a friend of mine, she teaches English as a second language to people in China. She lives three miles from me. She gets up at like two o'clock in the morning and she's dialing in and she's teaching people halfway around the planet. That is her job. Find a job that cannot be easily replaced by technology or by somebody else somewhere else. And that's where job security is. Healthcare, somebody half a planet away can't be operating on my brain, right? Or operating on my skull, finding my brain, right? Yeah. Uh, job security. You know, healthcare is where it's at. Providing services is where it's going to be at. But things like teaching, manufacturing, that kind of stuff, those things are going away. So South Side is looking at like we've got a bunch of manufacturing workers around here, and we need to take those manufacturing workers and equip them to do something else. And we got to take y'all and equip y'all to do something else. So I'll use IT as the example. If we can get enough of you here in Southside, to actually stay in Southside after you graduate with computer skills, guess what? Then we have a chance to bring in a computer company. And then we'll have jobs that are not based on manufacturing. But you know, no computer programming, no video game company, no, they're not gonna move here to South Hill if there's nobody here for them to hire, right? They're not gonna come here if there's no workers, so we're trying to get workers so that they can come here. And the quicker that we can get that base of workers, the quicker we can get them to come here. It kinda of sucks if you're the person who graduated from IT five years ago and you're still sitting there waiting for things to happen. Right? So if you're in doing something like IT or something like that, get as many of your friends and enemies to go through the program as possible so we can get the numbers up so it'd be that much quicker and easier if we can rope people in, right? That's kind of what we have to do here in Southside. We have to redefine, and that is like one of our missions here at Southside is to be redefining our workforce. What was your thing? I didn't even see anymore. Okay. <laughs> that was Amanda being politically correct, saying, not saying, I forgot what I was saying because you confused me so much. <laughs> Thank you for that. Anyway, so that was what, 20 minutes worth of. <laughs> Sidetrack rabbit hole, but, uh, but we, I would have ended up touching on 80% of that at some point in the semester, but that, that's good that we did that. But so. Next slide. <laughs> yeah, so ultimately, when the dust settles, we can't have it all. And any little change, even in our economy, it's like moving an aircraft carrier. It's going to be slow in our government. It's like moving an aircraft carrier. In anything in our society, it's like turning an aircraft carrier. Just think, when was the Emancipation Proclamation and when did actual equality happen? It was, six, it was 100 years difference. It was, 18, six, it was 1864, yeah. It was 1864, the Emancipation Proclamation, 63, 64, then Civil Rights Act of 1964, right? Just. just we're slow turning aircraft, and do we still have racism today? Yeah, we're slow turning aircraft carrier, but we, we eventually, hopefully, we'll get there. But we talked about this the other day, the idea that we don't have enough. We don't have enough time, don't have enough resources, don't have enough workers, don't have enough money, don't have enough knowledge. So we've got to deal with our limitations. We can't do all that we want to do or need to do, so we got to make priorities. If y'all had, I don't know, I'm trying to think of an example here. Uh, yeah. Do y'all buy DVDs anymore? DVD movies? No. <laughs> Download video games? Yeah. Buy CDs? Okay, let's go video games. Okay. Um, I can't. Uh, I, I can't. I can't even come up with an example. Okay. Uh, okay. There's this brand new video game out there. It's only it, for iPhone and Android. Um, it only costs five ninety nine. And the object of the game is you have this chicken, and you push the buttons on the screen, and then the chicken just sort of turns ahead and looks at it. Looks at you. Okay. Any of you pay five ninety nine for it? Anybody? Anybody? What would it take for you to do that? If you only have five ten bucks, what what apps are you buying? 
Certainly not that, right? <laughs> what would it take for you to get to a situation where you like, yeah, why not? A lot of stuff. You'd have to have a whole bunch of money and have already bought all of the games that you were really interested in, kind of interested in, mildly interested in, and kind of okay with before you got down to chicken head or whatever the game is, right? So we, 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 we've we got these limitations. We can't get down all the way down to that level there. So we got to set priorities. You see this game called Chicken Head and it's new on the App Store or something like that. You look at it and see what it is and all these zero star reviews. What are you going to do? You're going to move past it, right? And some of you could be like, well, I don't play video games, so I'm going to take my $5, $10. So I'm going to go to Burger King and get a couple of Whoppers, right? <laughs> Uh, one of you going to say, well, I'm going to take that $10, put it with a little bit more, give me an eight ball and have a party, right? You know who you are. Don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand, but I see a couple people that are just sort of getting a little nervous. Just, I don't know who you are yet, but you know, I will find out. So, shake your head to sketch here. You want to start a business. In order to start a business, you have to have four things before you get started. As an individual, and then as a society as a whole, these same rules apply. You gotta have four things in order to go as basic as you can. What would these be? Money. Money, no, not necessarily. Money. What? Idea. Will. Idea, you, you're getting there. What? Business plan. Business plan. Business plan is pulling this together. Yeah. Idea, that's actually, I, I, I'm holding off on that one because that's the fourth one on the list. I'll go. I, idea is part of it. Idea, interest, goal. That's that's all really part four. Before you even get to that, resources. Resources. What resources? Money. Resources for your product. What are you going to use money for? Pay your workers. What resources? Investors. Hmm. Why? Investors are giving you the money to buy the resources. What resources? That's what I'm getting for. What do we need? Resources are what? Things that we use, right? Okay. You need a place to do the work. You need people to do the work. You need tools and equipment to do the work. These are your resources. The fourth resource is? Knowledge, a textbook called entrepreneurship. You go with knowledge, by all means. It's, I mean, if you can spell entrepreneurship, I ought to give you extra credit, but just. No. You need a place to do the work, people to do the work. You need to know how to do the work, right? And then the equipment to do the work. You gotta have all that before you get started. The idea, a bakery. Gonna open a bakery. We gotta have, where's the building gonna be? You got to have tools and equipment. You need ovens, refrigerators, mixers, that kind of stuff. You need somebody to run the ovens and the mixers and that kind of stuff, drive your delivery truck, that kind of stuff. And then you got to know how to cook, right? I don't know how to cook very well, so I ain't running the bakery. These are the four things you got to have before you get started. And it's only if I know how to cook, I can get a land, I can get an oven, I can get a refrigerator, and I can hire a couple of workers, then and only then, do I hunt down my ingredients? I start buying my eggs, my sugar, my flour, if I'm in a, my vanilla extract, right? But you gotta have these things beforehand. Um, Lestaro was talking about investors. The point of investing, investors is to borrow money. Some of y'all are talking, you need money. You need the money, the investors, to get this stuff. The land, the labor, the capital. If you don't have the land, the, well, the land, the capital, you borrow money to get it. Right? That's what you're borrowing money for. I hope, maybe day one, you borrow money to buy the egg, sugar, and flour, but then hopefully you're making enough money off of your cakes to pay for the egg, sugar, and flour going forward, right? If you find yourself two, three, eight, 10, 35 months out, and you're still borrowing money in order to pay for the ingredients to go in your cakes, you've got problems. But you've got to have the land beforehand. You ain't sold any cakes, or it's not like I can take my cake money and use it to buy the land. I can't take my cake money and use it to buy the oven. You ain't got any cake money until you have the land in the oven. Right. So you gotta get these things to begin with. For you running your business, you gotta have these things for society as a whole. You have to have these things. 
We just talked about it a few minutes ago. South side of Virginia, around here, we got land, right? We have empty buildings around here too. We get tools and equipment, computers are pretty easy to get along with. We got workers, right? Do we necessarily have the knowledge we need in order to run a computer programming company here at Southside? So we need to get workers to get the knowledge, right? We, we're sort of lacking the proper labor. We have workers, but we don't have the right kind of workers. So do we have a computer programming company here? No. Or don't we have a Microsoft in Boynton? Uh, yeah, there's the Microsoft Data Center in Boynton. They're just running servers, um, and they, they keep expanding, keep expanding. Okay, it's a dirty little secret here. My dad is very nice. He's working. And he does that anyway? No, not enough money yet. Okay. They have a hard time finding workers. They're qualified, skilled workers. If you want job security now, go ahead, get that IT degree, and then go to Boynton. Brandon Boyton is like, well, it is still bigger than Dundas for any of you that are starting to get up to but it ain't a whole lot going on in Boyton. But what has, has, has had to happen is they had a hard, harder time finding workers when they came here than they thought they did, so they're having to transfer people from other parts of the United States and bring them in to run a data center. But they ended up getting a good deal on taxes, property taxes, and all this kind of stuff, and cheap water, cheap electricity, to do that to create jobs here. And there are people, local people working there. But it may only be a third to half of them that are working there are local people. The rest of them are imports. And half of them, or more, they ain't living in Boynton. Mm -hmm. They're living in Richmond or Raleigh, and they're doing the one-hour commute. They drive in every morning and they drive out in the afternoon and the only thing they did is maybe they bought lunch in a restaurant in Boynton. We're not getting the money out of this Microsoft data center that we were hoping. We ain't getting the jobs that we were hoping, but it's still, we're getting some money out of it. So there it is and Microsoft is keeping expanding it, but they're trying to they keep transporting, transferring people to bring them in. Well, I was on a tour of the place, oh, I don't know, it's three, four years ago now, and Kelly Barnes, Kelly LaPerry, and you all know her. She was with us, and we're sitting there with the head due to the place at the time, and we're sitting there, and I mean, and a couple of our deans were there with us. I mean, we, we did half a dozen of it. And Kelly, she just, just offhandedly, she talked about, she mentioned, well, I got this certification, that one, and that one. I can't remember how it came. And the dude, right there in front of our boss, everybody just looked her in the eye, do you want a job? <laughs> and he was serious. They're hungry for workers to have the skills. So if you're bored and looking for something to do and you don't know what you want to do and you want to grow up and you want to, but you still want to live around here, get an IT degree. We've had I'm, several people that's worked in our network services here, several of my former students who are now working out there. Um, I kind of joke about when college does realize how incompetent I am and they fire me, I'm stopping by there on my way home because I <laughs> think I've got enough game to be dangerous. And but. Anyway, but you got to have these things before you get started as an individual or as a society as a whole. We got to check all four of these boxes and we got to take advantage of the ones that we have. What do we have in America? Let's just compare, just stare at compare America to China. We're good at the knowledge thing. We've got a good educational system. Okay, you know, we're like our public schools, really? But when it comes to our university system, we're still at the top of the heap. We've got a good education system, and we've got good quality tools, equipment, and people who know how to use. So we solve problems with machines. What about China? Their education system isn't that good. Their tools and equipment or whatever isn't so good. So what do they do? They throw people at the problems. We handle it technologically. They handle it with humans, militarily. We're using drones and that cost millions of dollars a piece. It's the fighter jets that cost almost a billion dollars, where you heavy, expensive equipment, nuclear weapons to where one person can take care of an entire army, right? That's the way we handle it, where China, they have an army of a million people. So they're going to be approaching it with, well, we throw enough bodies at them. Yeah, they may have a fast shooting gun, but they're going to have to reload at some point, and we'll throw more bodies at them than they can bullets at us. Metaphorically, I mean, that's kind of, the, but employment-wise, we 
to work. We have highly skilled, highly trained manufacturing workers that are sitting there running a sewing machine the size of this classroom that can crank out a thousand t-shirts an hour. Where in China, what do they have? They don't have that. They've got a ton of people. So they got a thousand people sitting there with a needle and thread doing one t-shirt an hour, right? Either way, a thousand t-shirts an hour, a thousand t-shirts an hour. It's just the approach. How can you handle things? What do you have to work with? How can you handle it? As an individual, as a society, this is what you have. If you don't have this, then you ain't doing anything. Hating. There, if you look on the list of countries, Haiti, I think they finally got up to like 190 or something like that. They're, they're way down there. They're basically a rocky, mountainous island, very little education and a bunch of corrupt government. So whatever it does, food aid and other stuff that goes in there, these government officials are like skimming it off at the top and it ain't getting to the people. So what do they export? What do they sell? Tourism, right? Tourism is about the only thing they have going, but there ain't many tourists going down there to Haiti. Most people, you got as many missionaries going to Haiti as anything, trying to do things to help bring aid to the people there. So they have nothing to sell because they can't check their land. Isn't that good? They don't have that many workers. The workers they have don't have much education because the government don't want them to be too educated because then they make it hard enough to keep the government out of office. They don't have land equipment. They do have an airport and they do have a few docks where ships can park and that's kind of about it. So they can't really make much of anything that they can sell in order to get the money that they can use to buy anything from anybody else to change and adjust their society. So they're kind of just sitting still like, yeah, you know, I started to give you an example, but I'm holding out of that one for a week and a half. <laughs> I don't want to spoil the surprise. But you got to have these to go forward. Okay, so macroeconomics, what we're going to be doing this semester. The, did I skip a slide? Oh. Macroeconomics, this is a study of don't we just. <laughs> The economy as a whole. We're looking at a big picture here. The economy as a whole, industries as a whole. That's what we're going to be looking at this semester. Where next semester, for those of you that I haven't scared off and are crazy enough or whatever, microeconomics is a study of individual individuals. It almost looks the same, I know. Micro, small, right? Microeconomics, next semester we're gonna look at individual people, individual companies. With this semester, we're gonna be looking at governments as a whole, countries as a whole, states as a whole, or industries as a whole. This semester, we'll talk about the airline industry. Next semester, we'll talk about Delta. This semester, we'll talk about the automotive industry. Next semester, we'll talk about Toyota. See the difference there? This semester, we're going to talk about the population of the United States, the population of Virginia, the population of Brunswick County. Next semester, we're going to talk about you, me, my next door neighbor, my brother who beat me up way too much. So that's, that's the difference for what we, what's going on, the difference between this semester and next semester, where we're going, what we're doing. But what we're going to do, and I've already done this two or three times kind of on the fly here, is as we kind of already stumble into, it's a pretty ding dang darn complex world out there. And everything is pretty complex and interconnected and all that kind of stuff. How steel in China is import, impacting soybean farmers here in Virginia, right? It's so. Economists are looking at theories, models, we're doing statistics, that kind of stuff. Just like the weather people are coming up with statistical models to predict is it going to rain, yes or no, what are the odds it's going to rain. The economists are doing the same kind of crap. But what we have to do is we got to take things one bite at a time, which is going to actually roll into the next slide here. We economists, they're, they're studying the economy. They're making recommendations to the politicians, but it's up to the politicians to follow those recommendations. Just like the weatherman, they can look, or weather women, weather people, 
whether people, you know, they're sitting there, they're saying, well, it's an 80% chance it's going to rain tomorrow, but it's up to you to make the decision. Are you going to carry an umbrella? Right. So economists, they're coming up with theories and we're generally going to look at one thing at a time. How do you eat, eat an elephant one bite at a time? But we're going to simplify things. We're going to, I did the example of, what was it? I was like, you had two jobs, the doctor or the used car salesman. Well, in reality, there's a lot more jobs to choose from, right? But I'm just keeping it simple. I'm just talking about the two. We're going to do that. I'm going to, a lot of times, temporarily set aside reality because you can't think of it all at one time. You got to think of it in little bites. If you can understand this little bite and then that little bite and then that little bite, you can sort of understand some of the small stuff. So then hopefully at the end, you can sort of realize all these little small things merge together and make this big fur ball that is our planet. The only Latin for the semester is the Terrace Paribus. It's the assumption that nothing else is changing. The whole, we're ignoring everything else. If, I, if I'm using an example and I'm talking about, well, what, what would you do if the price of M&Ms goes up? Okay, you're going to buy less M&Ms. But I'm ignoring the, okay, the price of M&Ms is going up today. But if you look somewhere else, you might see the price of milk went down, that some people in the next county over lost their job, uh, interest rates went up a little bit. Um, the Turkish lira went down in value by another 3%. We're ignoring all of that. Just the fact that maybe you're sick today and you weren't yesterday. We're ignoring all of that and we're just like in a bubble. If nothing else changed, the only thing that changed was the price of M&Ms. How would your behavior change? Because maybe in reality, M&Ms got more expensive, so you should buy less M&Ms. But in reality, you were sick yesterday, you're healthy today, so you feel like eating M&Ms today, so you buy a pack today and you didn't yesterday, right? You know, so reality, so we're just going to look at one bite at a time. What happens if the M&M company changes their prices? We're ignoring all of the rest, so we got to keep it simple. Uh, simple is good because I can't handle anything else. Oh, this, my transition is broke on this slide, too. When you're reading, the news, watching the news on TV, listening to politicians and election seasons coming up. You gotta evaluate, is what they're saying, is it a positive statement or normative statement? I wish this was showing up on transition at the time. Positive, it's true, it's a fact. Can't dispute it. Milk is $3.60 a gallon. If you don't believe me, go look it up on a shelf. Bob is five foot six inches tall. If you don't believe me, take a ruler measure. Boom. There's no opinion, just the facts. Joe Friday would be proud, but y'all don't know who Joe Friday is, so we're right along. Anyone? Joe Friday? Anybody know? Oh, a TV show from the 50s called Dragon Man. They, they actually re did a movie remake of it in like the 80s or whatever. But just the facts thing. A normative statement. English majors, what's the word of normative? You English majors? Hmm? No. Oh, no, that's the normans. But normative. Normal. What's normal? What is normal? Normal is an opinion. No, okay, you get it? Normal is an opinion. Normal, we're getting to what is normal behavior for society. Those are the beha belief behaviors that society has decided is okay, is acceptable. And so that comes from the word norms that we go back to. What are the norms, the values of society? That's based on our opinion, based on our values, based on our judgment, based on who we are is gonna color the way we look at things. The fact is Bob is five foot six inches tall. Some people might say, well, that means Bob is too short. Some people say Bob is too tall. That's your opinion. The truth is Bob is five foot six. <laughs> Some people might say it's hot in here. Anybody? Really? Okay, for me it's hot, but then but for me it's hot. For the rest of y'all, it's cold. Those are opinions. The fact is the temperature is 
71 or whatever it is. <laughs> what? That's true. Yeah, I'm assuming that's true. I have no clue. Uh, I, I, I actually have one of infrared temperature guns. I really need to bring in one day, but anyway. But you know, milk is three dollars and sixty cents. That's positive. It's too expensive. Well, if you Bill Gates, do you think three sixty a gallon for milk is too expensive? No. You don't care, right? <laughs> you don't know. Does Bill Gates have a clue what the price of milk is? Well, they actually did a video about that not too long ago. They asked him like what the price of like certain things were. And he Yes, no I remember that. Yeah, he just he's got no clue. What, so if you ever see Bill Gates and you ask him, you, know, you want a Dr. Pepper or something, like, whatever it is, and he says, yeah, so that'll be twenty dollars. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but especially you politicians stuff, they're going to be so guilty. Even down to what Fox News and CNN and all that, they're going to be throwing out their opinions, trying to look at the facts. And that's kind of what why y'all are here as a college education is to find out what the facts are find out how you can process them yourself to make those judgments yourself instead of going along with what somebody else thinks. I gave y'all some normative statements earlier when I was giving y'all opinions about things. If you don't believe me, look it up yourself. Look it up, do your research, figure it out for yourself, and then call me a fool if that's what you need to call me because I'm making most of this stuff up off the top of my head as I'm going. So, okay. <laughs> but in economics, we try to go with the positive, but you got to watch out for the normative, and especially in this political climate, especially with the election coming up and that kind of stuff. They're going, there is going to be an interesting amount of value judgments being made, opinions. They're taking the fact and coloring it with opinion. Now, too many football players are kneeling in the national anthem. Not enough football players are kneeling in the national anthem. Well, the fact is 12 of them did it. That's the fact. You decide whatever it is. Well, yeah, one could have done, done it, and someone could have said that. That's too many. Yeah. Yeah. For, for some people, one is too many. For some people, one ain't enough. For some people, 12 ain't enough. It just depends. Uh, so when, when you're looking at stuff, when you're evaluating stuff, be on the lookout for positive and normative statements. And this brings me, and I'll shut up in like two minutes, because I know y'all are, even though y'all is seven more minutes off. But, this brings me to the, the example I talked about Tuesday with the kind of question that I ask you on the test. I'm not going to ask you, define positive statement, define normative statement. I'm going to have things like, Bob is five inches, to five foot six. Is this positive? Is this normative? Milk is too expensive. Is this positive? Is this normative? That's the kind of questions that I like to ask as you understanding and applying the stuff, not just gang memorizing definitions and that kind of thing. Because y'all know I can't memorize them, right? That's why I have everything in PowerPoint because I can't remember what I'm doing. At least I'm honest. Uh, huh? Oh, yeah, well, it ain't for another three, four weeks. But just we were the place for me to. Oh, oh. Uh, let, let me talk about this and then we'll go. I talked about we're gonna make we're gonna make these models. We're going to be doing this economic research. Everything that we're going to be doing when we're asking these questions, we're going to be assuming rational behavior. What would a normal, ordinary, prudent, sane person do? If the price of something goes up, are you going to buy more of it or less of it? You can buy less of it. If you get a pay raise, you can buy more stuff or less stuff? More. If your boyfriend cheats on you, are you going to date him twice as much or are you going to dump him? Yeah. Right. You know, just checking there. I was, <laughs> I was hoping somebody was like, yeah, no, no, I'm marrying that Lord, sure. No. But we're going to assume people are going to act in their own best interest. Which, and so generally speaking, we're going to assume normal. But there are some people that don't, in reality, that don't behave this way. There's some people when the prices get higher, they buy more of it. Middle school kids. <laughs> Tennis shoes. Need I say more? You know, the, you know, I ain't going to get caught dead in no Walmart $20 pair of sneakers in the school. I ain't going to get caught dead or whatever, them $30, $50 kit. No, no I got to have these $200 Jordans or what, right? See, yeah. I didn't like that in high school, but now I'm like, somebody got to pay for it myself. Like, yeah, I'm just Guess what? <laughs> Kids are not rational. That's why we don't let them vote. <laughs> because they don't make a logical decision of this pair of shoes is more expensive than that pair of shoes and these walk just as well as that one so let me buy the cheaper pair okay they don't think that way they one day they're professing their undying love and affection for one person and the very next day they're professing it for the next kid right they are rational you know I don't like peas well have you ever eaten one no 
kids aren't rational, we don't let them vote, right? But we're going to assume that people are going to behave rationally. The normal behavior is if the price goes up, we're not going to buy as much. If our income goes up, hopefully we'll buy more, right? Hopefully our income's go. Those are the behaviors we're going to assume. But guess what? Dirty little secret. Everybody behaves rationally for themselves. We might not think their decision makes sense, but to them, it does. Unless they're certifiable, institutional bound, right? <laughs> Other, just for some of us, you're like, why is that person living in a mansion but driving his busted piece of junk, 1973 rusted Ford Pinto? That doesn't make sense. But it might to that person because maybe that person just absolutely can't stand people who has social anxiety and so they stay at home and they work at home so they can put all their money in a home and the only time they use the car is once a month to go to the drugstore and fill their prescriptions. Right. So in that case, yeah, it makes sense to only have the piece of junk car. Why spend the money in it? Make the house better. People are going to make those judgments. Why are you going to hit? Don't tell me. Luke. Why is Luke going to leave here and he's going to go and get that eight ball hair when, when he leaves here? Most of us think that that's, not, that that's crazy. He shouldn't do that. That ain't right. But for him, he knows if he doesn't, he's going to have the jitters. He's going to not, he's going to have a long, ugly night ahead of him if he doesn't. <laughs> but, so he, and that's just what a heroin addict would tell you, right? But, you know, the, the behaviors might not make sense to us given our values, but it does make sense to people. So we need to hold it down a little bit when we start judging other people's behavior. Anyway, that's just me getting on a soapbox with a normative statement for a minute. <laughs> Any questions? Okay, well, I'll shut up and you can get out. And this is another two minutes that you owe me. So I will see you all next Tuesday. And drive safe, if you dare.